Um, hello and welcome. Uh, many thanks for being here. I'm Mike Wentz. I'm the program director at Woodland Pattern here in Milwaukee, where I am. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that we, in Mo or we at Woodland Pattern acknowledge that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin Sovereign, Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, so yeah, many, many, many thanks to Brian Tier, to um, Mona Lisa Saloy and Craig Santos Perez for joining us over the next couple of evenings. Um, and uh, of course, to all of you for being here as well. Um, we hope you can be with us tomorrow, uh, March 19th, for a reading featuring uh, Brian, Mona Lisa, and Craig. This evening, we're here for a, a discussion right around um, poetry and creative practice and the intersection with the climate crisis. Um, tomorrow will be a poetry reading featuring um, all three, and that'll be amazing. So please, yeah, join us tomorrow for that. Um, the, the link for that you can find on our website, woodlandpattern.org. Um, same as you likely found this one. Um, so the programs happening tonight and tomorrow are part of a larger series um, that's been ongoing for a little bit now and we'll, we'll continue through the spring and beyond. Um, this series is called The First Function of Poetry, a social justice series, um, taking the name from a quote by June Jordan, um, quote, the first function of poetry is to tell the truth, to learn how to do that, to find out what you really feel and what you really think. Um, the series is ongoing, as I said, and will continue on May 19th and 20th. Uh, that will be with a discussion and reading featuring Monica Sock, uh, Maider Vang, and Dunya McHale. Um, the focus for both of the, the discussion and reading will be on the ways in which um, writing and creative practice can address and articulate the experiences of diasporic and refugee communities. Um, for more information about these and other upcoming programs, uh, again, please visit our website or find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and I do want to mention also that um, this particular set of events, um, these climate crisis events, in addition to being part of the First Function series, are also um, part of um, a set of programs that's presented as part of the um, Poetry Coalition's shared programming around a theme of social importance. Um, so we're members of the Poetry Coalition. Um, and this year's series called, It is Burning, It is Dreaming, It is Waking Up, um, from a poem by Linda Hogan called Map. Um, amazing poem. Um, the focus of, of the, these events this year in March is on poetry and environmental justice. Um, the Poetry Coalition programs are made possible with generous support from the Mellon Foundation. So a huge thank you to the Mellon Foundation and, for making this possible and to our friends in the Poetry Coalition who are all hosting um, their own amazing programs this month. So I do wanna share first of, first, first of several links. Um, this one, um, so a link to check out the Poetry Coalition um, and all of the member organizations. Um, and there's just so much amazing stuff going on. Um, uh, next, I would love to say that we're so grateful to uh, Pity Milk Press. Um, here in Milwaukee for designing and printing some um, beautiful broadsides featuring poems by um, Craig, Brian, and Mona Lisa. I, um, I will have them to show you on, the, on camera if you're here tomorrow night, but don't tonight. Um, but thanks uh, so much, Biddy Milk Press, Chelsea, and Edie. Uh, we're making these available as a gift for attendees um, with one broadside per person. So I'll, I'll share a link um, or a form link rather in the chat. So if you follow this link, there's a form you can fill out um, and submit to us to receive a broadside by mail. Um, and the reason it's one per person and also just for you to note is that these are limited print runs. Um, 
So just in case it's uh, possible, we might run out. Um, uh, hopefully not, and hopefully we'll have broadsides for all who are interested, but um, just to let you know that. Um, and in any case, thank you. I hope you're interested. They're, they're really beautiful and come back tomorrow night so you can see them on camera. Um, and for the amazing poetry, um, obviously that's reason one to come back. Um, we have books for sale by um, Brian, uh, Mona Lisa and Craig in our online book center, um, includes, including um, you know, each of their most recent books, um, respectively, um, Doomstead Days, uh, uh, Second Line Home and Habitat Threshold. Um, and here is another link to our online book center um, where you can um, take a look for those particular titles and others by, um, by all three. And um, then I would like to say, this is the final link I'll share with you. Um, as a nonprofit organization, that um, your individual support goes a long way towards sustaining us and helping us continue to present programs of this kind. Um, with that having been said, I'm gonna share a link to a, um, a give what you can ticket donation. Um, and if you're in a position to give, we greatly can uh, appreciate you doing so. Um, but of course, more than anything, are so appreciative of you simply being here and sharing this space with us, which is the most important form of support. Um, there will be time for audience questions this evening. Um, and I invite you to share your questions in the chat throughout. Um, so at any point in time, if you have a question, share it. Um, this is not to say we'll get to it immediately, but it would be great to have those um, there for us as we get to that part of the evening. So feel free to pop questions there. Um, you know, given the logistics of this evening's presentation, I think it's easiest to, uh, I'll, I'll field those and read those, but, um, and it would be really nice to have them in the chat too for folks to read um, themselves. Um, okay. And finally, before we get, begin here, just a little bit about our panelists. Um, Dr. Craig Santos Perez is an indigenous Chamorro from uh, the Pacific Island of Guam. He is the author of five books of poetry and the co-editor of five anthologies focused on indigenous literature, geopoetics, and eco-literature. He has received the American Book Award, Penn Center USA Poetry Society of America Literary Prize, and the Hawaii Literary Arts Council Award, as well as fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, and the American Council of Learned Societies. He is a professor in the English department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Dr. Mona Lisa Saloy is a poet, folklorist, educator, and scholar, an award-winning author of contemporary Creole culture in poems about Black New Orleans before and after Katrina. As a folklorist, Saloy documents sidewalk songs, jump rope rhymes, and clap hand games to discuss the importance of play. As a poet, her first book, Red Beans and Rice Lee Yours, won the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award. She's written on the significance of the Black Beat Poets, on the African-American toasting tradition, on Black and Creole talk, and on conditions and keeping Creole after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Her new book, Second Line Home, is a refreshing collection of poems that captures the day-to-day -day New Orleans speech, contemplates family dynamics, celebrates New Orleans, and all in a way that everyday people can enjoy. A 2020 Guggenheim Fellow, Brian Teer, is the author of six critically acclaimed books, including Companion Grasses, a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Award, and The Empty Form Goes All the Way to Heaven. His most recent book, Doomstead Days, was long listed for the 19, 2019 National Book Award and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle, Kingsley Tufts, and Lambda Literary Awards. He's also published eight chat books, including Paradise Was Typeset, Soar Eros, and Headlands Quadrats. His honors include the Four Quartets Prize, Lambda Literary and Publishing Triangle Awards, and fellowships from the NEA, the Pew Foundation, the American Antiquarian Society, um, the Headlands Center for the Arts, the Vermont Studio Center, and the McDowell Colony. After over a decade of teaching and writing in the San Francisco Bay Area and eight years in Philadelphia, he's now an associate professor at the University of Virginia and lives in Charlottesville, where he makes books by hand for his Micropress Albion Books. Thanks so much to all three of you for being here. Um,
such a pleasure. I really appreciate it. So I'm just going to jump right in with this question and I'll share my own questions in the chat too, as I ask them just so they're there to be read as well. Um, so question the first. Um, so what is your own um, personal connection to the climate crisis? Uh, what impact does living in the Anthropocene have on you generally and on your work as a poet? How does it affect and inform your practice and voice? And you can sort of chime in as the spirit moves or as you feel ready to do so. Or should I start? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so this is so important. How can I begin? This affects everyone. There's no, when the ground is falling underneath you from an earthquake, there's no race, there's no culture, there's humanity, there's animals, there's there's flora, things are destroyed. And then we all have to begin rebuilding. So in, in my personal experience, it's been hurricanes. And I grew up with them. It's, it's a seasonal occasion. And so much so we make fun of it sometimes. We say, see you in the gumbo. <laughs> but the reality is that when it whips, it whips and it destroys so much so that we have toothless neighborhoods now. And just personally, it took me 16 moves in 14 and a half years and 12 different addresses to get home. And that is not uncommon. Most of us moved five times after Katrina happened because when everything is wiped out, there's no place to go. There was no place to live. There was no power. Everything was filthy. Everything was cut off. So the climate change is real. It's people still ignore it. But even with this COVID crisis, we are learning we can no longer ignore it. And just look what God has done in the interim. We are slowed down. There's less emissions from all these cars, although Today, it seemed like there was too much traffic. It seems like people are back almost to the normal and they're ignoring the admonitions to slow down and, and stay off the road and stay in your homes. It seems like people are lightening up. It's not over and this is still killing people. And if you're in a spot, say the Northeast where you see the death all the time, even in the South, our numbers are down, but I've buried too many people and there's, it's just, so my connection has been extremely personal in, in terms of not just Katrina, but the resulting hurricanes. And, and they're still wrecking havoc to people that I'm related to or know. It's, and so it's not as though there are many more, they're more intense. And they're coming earlier. And they're staying later. So this is scary. And that's not all the other crises. That's just hurricanes. So it has a great impact on me and my family, my region, my beloved New Orleans and Louisiana, but also Alabama and Mississippi and Texas and Florida and the Carolinas. And it's just, even the Northeast has had a taste from Hurricane Sandy. So it's real and we have to wake up and we have to, we all are responsible. I think one of the things that Mona Lisa points to that I, I think about a lot is that is the sort of leap that we all have to make between our sort of perspective on the ground, our local communities, and then these larger patterns that are sort of biospheric. And it's, it's easier for us, I think, who feel it in our immediate communities to kind of conceive of it. 
um, because we see, as as Mona Lisa has said, you, it's impossible to ignore Katrina, a hurricane. Um, where I'm, my people are from is from Alabama, and so there it's been tornadoes. But I lived in the Bay Area for a long time, which, as y'all know, is now on fire. <laughs> Um, every year in a, in a much more intense way. And then the places I've lived since then have had their own variations on this. In, so I do think that, I, f I think it's in one way learning, because I've moved around so much, it's learning what this looks like in each individual place and learning the politics and the manifestations of that in each individual place, and then trying to think through what that means for the community and for my way of living in that place. But then also, you know, how I participate in these much larger systems um, that connect all of these places together and connect us all to the biosphere. And I don't think that there's one part of my life from eating to drinking to, um, zooming <laughs> that isn't touched by um, this sort of hyper connectivity but also this hyper locality and I feel that that tension between the hyper connectivity with the large and then this really hyper local politics I feel that tension a lot and don't have any way to really resolve it but I and I'm not sure it's resolvable or it's something that need, needs to be resolved, but it's a, definitely a place I write from quite often. Um, it's trying to, to, to think from the particularities of our, of our local experience and our local experience of catastrophe or pollution or um, industry or settler colonialism or whatever the dynamics are in, in our particular homes um, and how those are part of these much larger systems. Um, yeah, I would say, I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but that's maybe where I would begin myself. Yeah, half a day. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Woodland Pattern, everyone for coming. I'm so honored to be part of this conversation with Brian and Mona Lisa. Um, I appreciate the acknowledgments that, that was made at the beginning and I just want to give my own. I'm, I'm zooming from the island of Oahu and so I want to acknowledge the Kanaka Uivi or Native Hawaiian people. And I mentioned that because as as Brian said, you know, so much of my writing in the, in the past couple of years have been located in this place I now live, as well as, you know, my ancestral homelands of Guam in, in the Western Pacific. As probably all of you are aware, the the Pacific region has been feeling the impacts of, of climate change pretty intensely, uh, both from increased and more powerful hurricanes to incredibly hot record-breaking summers, uh, to the acidification of our oceans, coral bleaching, and the most existential threat is, is rising sea levels, which are uh, inundating many of our, our coastlines as well as our, our low-lying islands. And you know the impact beyond the climate in terms of the Anthropocene. You know you've probably heard of the the Great Pacific uh, Garbage Patch, or uh, you know filled part of the ocean filled with plastic. You know oftentimes taking my daughter to the beach, we you know we can't help but notice all the plastic washing up upon the sands. Uh, moreover, uh, Hawaii and Guam are, are very militarized places. And as you might know, the US military is one of the largest carbon emitters on the planet. And so, uh, you know, life here in Hawaii and in the Pacific is, is really entangled in the climate crisis and the Anthropocene. And my new book, uh, Habitat Threshold, published last year, is, is, was entirely about this topic. Uh, my previous four books were more so about uh, family and memory and, and culture. Uh, but I turned you know, to a new topic for this book because uh, the crisis was feeling so urgent. And it's kind of what I've been working on the last five years. Uh, at the same time, uh, my first and then second daughters were born. And so the book is also about my own anxieties and concerns as a new parent during a time of climate change. And so 
uh, those themes all have uh, come together in, in my new work and it's really uh, informed my practice and I think my poetic voice, which has become uh, much more urgent and, and place-based, but also, as, as Brian mentioned, also uh, planetary and you know, trying to cultivate a, a kind of ecological consciousness in terms of seeing those interconnections, entanglements and, and intimacies. Yeah, thank you all so much. Okay, may I just add something, please? Thank you, and thank you for reminding me, Craig. I too am honored to be here and, and joining Brian and Craig in this conversation. And Michael, thank you for having us. And this is so important, but I forgot to answer about my work. Well, Brian touched on it as well as Craig, and it's so intense and it's overwhelming, this, this change in the world and, and how it affects us. And like Craig, my first book, it won two national prizes, but that's not the point. It was happy. It was about happy New Orleans, you know, <laughs> our second lines and our parades and, and family and celebration. And I'm thankful for that because I wanted to capture what I felt wasn't captured. But this one behind me, second line home, it's post Katrina. So as June Jordan suggests, we have to tell the truth. So I had to capture the horror of displacement, the horror of disaster responsibly. As artists, we are responsible to tell the truth and, and as writers even more so because we create the human history. What happens between the big events, the dates that are monumental, we tell how people are feeling and how how we survive or not these times. And so it has affected my voice tremendously. The first book is light and, and happy and the second one is more somber. And I'm thankful that people have told me it's not just my evacuation story, it's theirs too. So I, I felt like I did some truth telling and it's not over because I'm still writing it because it's still not over. It's, it's never over and that's what people don't understand. I just wanted to add that. Sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and again, thanks to each of you for sharing those experiences and um, and I suppose keeping all of that in mind, especially that second question about practice and about um, um, writing or creating through this. The next question I had was sort of more generally, what impact can poetry have in the face of ongoing environmental devastation? Um, what poss possibilities does it have as therapy, as contemplation, agitation, connective tissue, or whatever else might you think might apply? Should I go again or Brian, are you? No, I think you should go. I... <laughs> okay, <laughs> bless you. Okay, so again, because it's the human history poetry, it's, 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 it's our contemplation. It's, it's what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And it connects us to our brothers and sisters to our cousins that we didn't know we had, to anyone who has experienced anything similar or who wondered about it. It's if we don't tell it, people won't know. And in terms of telling the truth, we have to let people know this is not over. If you've been through any disaster, if you witnessed, witnessed any disaster, I'll never forget watching that earthquake where the interstate collapsed in San Francisco and in Oakland on the and, and cars were falling into the ground. And I'm way over here in the South, but boy, I, I couldn't understand what they could do. It just so the poets on the West Coast told me and the fear and the anxiety and just, and I felt so connected. It was totally opposite to what we're experiencing in the South, but 
just the horror of it. When all those, those family homes burned in California, I don't care if they were rich or poor, I don't care what neighborhood it was in. When you see everything people have worked for all their lives disappear in ash and smoke, to witness that is one thing, to see it on the news is another, but to read about it from someone who's experienced it, it's, it teaches us, it teaches us how to survive, how to maintain our humanity, how to be kind to one another, how, how to realize that what's the most important thing? It's not the stuff. Although we need stuff, we want security, but it, it lets us know how fragile we are in this universe. And the climate is, is far more a controlling factor than we want to admit. And so it reminds us of all of that. And so to me, poetry has to be in the face of everything so that we are taught what is. Yeah, today I was, I mean, your questions, Mike, they're really big, which I celebrate and, and honor. They're also sort of impossible to answer and I would probably answer them differently every day. Um, because I feel like my mind is not, it's, is not made up about any of these. Um, today, my answer um, is informed by having taught um, Muriel Rukeyser's The Book of the Dead, her documentary poem, The Book of the Dead, about um, the Hawks Nest mining disaster, which happened in West Virginia. And what's different for me about teaching this poem is that the company that was in, uh, invested in that mining disaster was in Charlottesville, which never I never noticed um, in that poem. And this is the first time I've taught that poem living here. So suddenly I'm in a landscape that in part was invested in extracting um, labor and basically murdering all of these men um, who labored in the mines. Um, but I taught it, I taught it this week. And one of my students today asked the question that, um, what does the act of naming in a poem do? Why name these laborers? What does that work, what work gets done in, in the poem? And it was a fascinating, I thought it was such an obvious, like, of, co of course you know what naming in a poem does, like, why are you asking that? Um, but I forget that people are 18 or 19. <laughs> um, and haven't always encountered that gesture. And so we have this really powerful conversation about the document and about what bringing the names of the dead into the community of the living can do um, and how that can address, um, it can't get rid of the injustice that sent those men to their grave, but it can address the injustice of erasing that they lived and that they were basically murdered by these corporations. Um, and it can um, also redress the fact of erasing them from history and bringing them back into living community with us. And the thing I think that's what connects us to climate crisis for me um, and made me think about some of the tropes of climate writing, like naming species, for instance, um, is that these are species that none of us really, you know, most of us in our ordinary lives never think about. They're not in the community of the living for most of us, and we don't behave as though they are. Um, and we don't even behave as if the ocean were in the community of our living. Um, so I am beginning to, today, I really thought about the ways in which naming things and naming something as obvious as ocean can do this work for some readers of bringing them back into living relation and possibly into ethical thinking 
about their living relation to other beings and other creatures, as well as other humans, right, who are also part of this very large network. Um, so I do think poetry, um, some poetry can do that, can do that work of calling us back into mindful and ethical and living relation with the largest of systems, as well as these smaller manifestations of our connectivity. Yes, for me, uh, definitely poetry has been therapeutic as a way to to just reckon with the, the fear and, and anxiety I've been feeling these, these last couple of years. Um, so it's been a, a really a real healing space. And, you know, when, when the poems are published, you know, I feel proud in some ways because they poetry can also work to expose critique and and protest uh, the various environmental injustices that that I might be writing about. And I think a lot of, you know, like Ruckheiser's work does does much of that same kind of raising awareness about certain issues that other people may not know about. Uh, this is, of course, important in the Pacific, where uh, folks on the continent or in other parts of the world may not know what's happening here because of, of biased media coverage. And so, you know, I think that's an important uh, part of the poetic power or its functions. Uh, I also believe that, you know, climate poetry or eco poetry has a pedagogical function. Um, I was lucky that my most recent book was taught in a high school class, and the teachers very smartly uh, use the poems, you know, to uh, teach the students environmental literacy. And you know they kind of would research the topic, learn about it, but they do so through the poetry or, or through the humanities, uh, thus becoming kind of a creative gateway towards lear learning more about environmentalism and, and science and so on. Uh, lastly, I've been really inspired by how a lot of this kind of poetry has entered the public sphere and uh, political movements. Uh, for example, I, I love going to uh climate change marches rallies or environmental protests there's always poets reading their poems uh, musicians and artists that are contributing to the movement and so I, I believe that you know poets and other creatives have a, a integral role to play in the environmental movement because we need these creative stories to to kind of uh, speak to uh, you know more of the the human element of of, environment, of environmentalism. And I think it's, it's much more inspiring and empowering when we hear you know, someone read a poem as opposed to just uh, reading data or a scientific report. Okay, thank you all again. And yeah, and I, um, so there's some comments coming up in, in the chat, which I very much appreciate. And I like you know, this one from Heidi, right? That I, appre I so appreciate you saying your mind is not made up and that your answer would change every day. Thank you for that. Um, which, yeah, right. Um, and, and likewise from Brenda, poetry, bringing readers into ethical and mindful thinking, living relation. Um, but yeah, the, the idea that, that, of course, your mind wouldn't be um, made up about any of these, um, but hopefully, my dialogue gets us towards, um, you know, some further understanding of, of import. But um, so, yeah, and I think there was some leaning towards um, this next question already um, in the conversation that's happened. Um, and here I go, I'll post it. But um, so uh, confronting the climate crisis activates further questions about the intersections with other important social issues, right? It's not climate crisis an issue unto itself in a vacuum. And we've already, folks have already talked about this, but um, carrying on things like racial and economic justice, refugee crises, disability justice, animal non-human rights, et cetera. What are some ways in which, um, I mean, you might talk about this issue generally, but in particular also what are some ways in which poetic language in particular can effectively maybe articulate, address, or sort of make these connections?
All right, I'll jump in. Although uh, Brian is, and, and both Craig are just brilliantly addressing all this. <laughs> I'm, I'm really just responding generally, but certainly, one of the things I tried to do in this, this book, Second Line Home, is, is capture and articulate the disparity after a disaster. And ju just on a personal note, everybody left, and this was the first time it was a required evacuation because Katrina was so massive, it was all over the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what we knew. And it was headed dead for us. So everyone I know left with a change of clothes. And if you had an animal, dog food, the animal. <laughs> and in my case, I don't have children or a husband. I left with my neighbor, my elderly neighbor. She said, but we're not leaving. I said, but we have to, because my cousin had a dream. And she said, we got to go, the water's coming. <laughs> and so you draw on everything. You draw on your folklore, your traditions. So we left and we landed in another city. And so the dust had not set, the water had not settled yet. And all I know was my university was flooded. There was no place to live. And I needed a job because I had bills. So I went to the community college. And of course, what did I take? Comfortable clothes, pajamas, <laughs> change of underwear. <laughs> toiletries, dog food, water, and I had a little ethnic outfit. So here I am for a college adjunct job in an ethnic outfit. And the man was so rude to me. He didn't, I had my CV. I even, and let me tell you, I'm a late bloomer because I was a caregiver for my dad for a decade and a half during the crack epidemic. I didn't know what I was getting into. It's not about that, but and it was some of the best years of my life. But so it took me a while to finish the PhD. I brought the PhD with me. <laughs> I said, I'm not leaving it. So I had this thing. And so I had proof because everything was, everything was just, just everything was gone. There was no connection. And the rudeness and the racist attitude of this administrator to a black woman who was coming for a job that wasn't in a suit, that didn't look like a business person, not looking at all my years of experience that I taught at three research one schools, but that I'd come from an HBCU recently. And who did I think I was? And even though I knew he was, I still cried. The personal toll of people's response during a disaster cannot be un underestimated. And, on, and people have written articles, but it's the poets who captured that. It's what I tried to do to some degree. And I've never really written a poem about that particular incident, but that's the one that hurts the most in the sense that other people, were, other people gave me water to drink or gave me clothes. And I never got rid of them because they were a gift when I had nothing, but just the attitude of someone who feels superior, feels privileged, and that there is no way that someone who looked like me was worthy. It's, it's an added, it's the, the, the climate crisis compounds all the injustice. It compounds all the social issues. I can't even imagine what the people who had mental issues, mental health issues did. If those of us who were supposedly sane, supposedly educated, supposedly well-spoken or whatever, can't make it, can't function, what did they do? And I don't know, how do we, how do we preserve justice? How do we, how do we remain humane? And to me, poetry has to capture that. And I'm still trying and still working at it. And I know others 
have, and I'm proud of them. And that's our job. And, and hopefully we change minds, hopefully we change hearts, or hopefully we get an amen and say, yeah, if nothing else. And that's on all over the place, sorry. Greg, why don't you talk next? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, as, as Mona and Lisa mentioned, uh, you know, having an intersectional view is, is so important because all these issues are related. Uh, as we know, you know, environmental devastation and the climate crisis is impacting disproportionately, uh, you know, peoples of color, low income communities, uh, you know, native reservations and you know, of course, many countries in the so-called global south. And so, you know, it's important for us to reckon with, with environmental injustice because that's, that's part of the crisis and, you know, related, of course, to, to capitalism and imperialism and colonialism as well. Um, you, know, you mentioned the, the refugee crisis, crises. Uh, of course, that's related to the climate crisis. Um, whether it's, it's a Syrian refugee crisis or many Pacific Islander communities here who are forced to leave their homes because uh, the waters are rising and the, the ocean is basically seeping up through, through the sands. Um, you know, we live in a time of, of the sixth mass extinction. Uh, so we have to think about animal and, and more than human rights and protections uh, here in Hawaii. You know, it's known as the bird extinction capital of the world because so many of our bird species are either endangered or extinct. And so these are a lot of difficult issues, of course, um, but I think poetry is a space where we can articulate those intersections, um, partly because I think that, you know, poetry really has the power to highlight those connections uh, largely through some of its lyrical impulses towards associations, right, where poetry can kind of make these leaps, uh, whether metaphorically, like this thing is like that, or, you know, from one line to another, you can make a connection between what's happening here in Hawaii to what's happening in Syria. And with that associative power, poetry can uh, cultivate in our imaginations a more, a more uh, intersectional and international uh, and interconnected uh, consciousness where we can see all these things together in, in one on the page and you know when we see it in that way then you know as as both Brian and Mona Lisa said earlier it creates a kind of ethical moment for the reader um, which I think is very powerful and then lastly you know again just echoing Mona Lisa throughout but uh, to tell the human stories of, of tragedy and trauma, but also of resistance and resilience. Uh, we need those stories to inspire us and give us hope so that we can address these very difficult, complex issues. But thank you, I'll pass it over to Brian. Yeah, I think having, honestly, having panels like this that are themselves intersectional um, is important of having conversations um, where I know in my own experience, I've often been a white and eco-poet on a panel of white eco-poets um, talking about environmental issues that ignore the kind of intersectionality or gesture toward the intersectionality that Craig is talking about, but without um, community members from an intersectional group of, of communities there, all of whom are stakeholders in the local politics, right? Not to mention the global biospheric politics. So, so I, I am happy that we are having this conversation together and honored to be a part of it. Um, I do, I think about this a lot because I taught, I went from the Bay Area to Philadelphia and taught um, you know, environmental writing to many people, unlike in the Bay where you could, even if you didn't like nature, you had this fantasy that you were there in it because of the Bay. 
Um, in Philly, it was really the opposite. Like it was completely acceptable to hate nature and to think that you were not part of it and that you didn't like it. And and um, and I would have students who who would wind up in my classes. Um, who really would challenge me in great ways of like, why is this, why is any of this of importance to me? And it really ended up making me um, rethink what I taught, how I taught, um, and to rethink the basic issues, and most of which I think come down to embodiment um, in terms of water, in terms of food, in terms of air, in terms of safety, like what are the contact points between almost anybody um, and the natural systems around them? Usually it's water and air and the part of their food shed. Um, and so to me, I started reorganizing my thought and my teaching around the ways in which um, almost all of us embody ourselves in relationship to the world around us um, and what we all really share um, in terms of our groundedness. But I also think it's one of the special powers to go back to, to Craig's point, it's one of the special powers of poetry is that it persuades with the body in a way um, that I think prose can, but often doesn't choose to, or chooses to go into the mind place. Um, and, and I love poetry's capacity to persuade with the body um, while also doing thinky things like doing the kinds of ethical moves or the human story moves um, so that you can bring the human story of another person into the body in this rhythmic persuasive way um, so that the very body is persuaded to feel sometimes even in ways that the mind is not ready for um, or doesn't know that it has the capacity um, to go there. And so I love that about poetry. It's the thing that I trust um, as a device to bring us into greater relation um, because it's also seductive and we need to sometimes be seduced um, into even into ethics. Um, and so I love that about poetry too, that it can have, it can give us permission to feel the sensual contact points of our lives with the world around us when so much of the world does not want us to make that contact um, with each other across communities, but also with the living sentient world around us. Um, so I think poetry has that capacity um, and poets, freaks that we often are, um, also have that capacity to, 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 to give permission to other people um, in, to be in that relation. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love this. Um, I do want to say, uh, before I ask another question and post another question, also, we'd love to hear from you all out there. If you all have questions, again, please feel free at any point to share those in the chat. Um, but uh, moving along to, to perhaps maybe a too broad <laughs> question. <laughs> um, but I mean, of course, one well worth asking and perhaps, um, I mean, of course, answer this however you will, but perhaps um, to give it maybe something a little less uh, open as like thinking about it in the context of what's been discussed already and the connections that poetry and writing can forge perhaps, um, or however you'd like. But the question is this, um, what do you see as some solutions to the problems posed by the climate crisis? Can I weigh in? I, I just, uh, it was so overwhelming to not only to personally lose everything, but my neighborhood, my culture, love the world over. And there are more Africans sold in New Orleans than any other city in the country. So we kept that. We, that's where the food comes from. That's where the camaraderie comes from. We're nosy. We welcome everybody. We talk to everybody. But we had to switch up. We, and it's not that we don't live in the present any longer, but we have had to 
work on the ground to affect change. And I just wanna give a shout out to some of the neighborhood resources that as an individual I had to partner with to learn how to do something besides write, read and write. So one of the first groups to partner with my neighborhood association, I had to attend meetings for weeks, for, for two years to figure out, because my neighbor, all my elders were gone. They died and with the stress took them out. So we lost all that knowledge. We lost that culture. And so we reformed the neighborhood association. And one of the groups that first reached out to us was called Waterwise. It's now Waterwise South. So I have a rain garden. It holds some like 80 to 100 gallons of water, 150 gallons of water. And so, and Waterwise, they, they, they partner with a bunch of people. But interesting, they use language. They say, don't let that trash, how does it go? Don't let that trash float by you. The word by you, <laughs> don't let, so you can't, you have to not let trash get in the drains. You have to, we can, everybody can do something. So I love that language is there. Levies.org, they, they tell the story, they raise money. Soul gave us trees. New Orleans was, is still the most deforested city in the South. And more so after Katrina because of the hurricanes and soul is sustaining our urban landscape. So I got free trees from them. And let me tell you, the water would get putrid in a short amount of time, mosquitoes and the wet foot, they taught us about wet foot trees. And so we just had a planting all around the park across the street from, I live across the street from a park. And so now instead of four feet of standing water, all those trees are drunk on this, the water. And so. And, and they just asked for volunteers. So there are people who are doing things. And then there's this other group called I See Change and they kind of monitor flooding. And so this is going on everywhere, but there, I've asked everybody to channel your interest above the page and into organizations that are actually doing something. And so I, I just had to shout out to those organizations because they have taught me what I needed to know. That never occurred to me because this climate change is real. And so we have to teach each other what we don't know. Each one has to teach one. The Baha'is say that. And I, I've always loved that. And so we poetry does that with every poem, with every phrase. And we, we just, that's what we have to do. But anyway, I, I feel like each one, we have to do, if it's only picking up trash, if it's only recycling, we have to. And we have to think about getting rid of all this plastic. Craig mentioned plastic. We have to do what we can do. And we have to not be so selfish. And when I say selfish, I mean, we live so well in America, even when we don't have a lot, we have, we used to have lights 24 seven and hot and cold running water, but we can't even depend on clean water everywhere. So something has to give and we, we each are responsible. So we, we can't be isolated. We can't be just academics. We can't be just poets. We are human citizens of this planet and we have to work together. Okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. <laughs> I do. Oh, Craig. No, Craig, why don't you go ahead? I think. Oh, it's just a second. Go second again, if, if that helps. Um, well, I just want to first thank uh, Mona Lisa for really sharing her, her very uh, personal, vulnerable, and powerful stories. Um, and, and to thank Brian for his uh, very seductive ethics. I feel like both of those, both of those acts are, are, are two important solutions, so to speak. Um, but, but more generally, of course, and this is, you know, very obvious, but, uh, you know, it's so important for us to, to divest from, uh, you know, the, the carbon industries, uh, decarbonization is, if we don't urgently do that, then there's, you know, that we're going to, it's going to get so much worse. And so that is so important. Um, uh, obviously a just transition or just transitions, uh, for folks, and different communities, um, you know, so that we ad address environmental justice and environmental racism as we hopefully transition to a, 
you know, a quote unquote green or, or more sustainable circular economies is, is crucial. And, uh, you know, obviously we also need to address, you know, things like repair and reparations for, for communities that have been disproportionately impacted. And, you know, so all of those things are, are so important, um, you know, um, and beyond that, you know, smaller things in our personal lives, of course, but then also to, to join both local, national and international movements and, uh, you know, to, to show uh, the kind of people power that we have when we all come together. And of course, the climate justice movement has done a great job, I think, uh, you know, motivating or mobilizing a global network of people who are fighting for these solutions in their various countries. It's, it's going to be a difficult fight, um, but I think, you know, we kind of know the way and now we have to, we really have to fight for our lives to, to make it happen. Yeah, I love, I want to second um, Craig's gratitude to Mona Lisa for sharing um, stories that I, um, are powerful and vulnerable. And um, I, um, someone just wrote a comment about often our um, solutions leave out the accountability of large corporations. Um, and trying to um, hold them accountable. And, and I, I actually recently read by a, a kind of establishment white environmental writer, Elizabeth Colbert, um, her new book, Under a White Sky. And um, she's the one who wrote The Sixth Extinction and won the Pulitzer Prize for this book. And um, someone who's a very good science writer. And I read this um, new book and it totally freaked me out um, because the kind of politics I believe in, the kind of politics that Craig and, and Mona Lisa have articulated in terms of um, grassroots level, level and local needs organizing. Um, her book went in the completely opposite direction, which I fear is the direction that the sort of corporate capitalism and technocracy and also sort of like big science are going to go toward, which is like the, the arc of this book was like, yeah, it's probably a really bad idea, but we're really so screwed that probably we're gonna have to geoengineer. Like probably we're gonna have to like, you know, put sulfur dioxide in, in, the, in, in the atmosphere. And that we're probably, cause we're just, the, we're on track for the four degrees, like that's going to happen. Um, all the carbon is already there in the ocean. It's just going to keep warming. Like this is kind of one of the arcs in the book. And so there's nothing, like she literally ignores any other possibility um, because she's like, the problem is so large. Um, that these smaller, I mean, the implication is that there's nothing else, but geoengineering that could really address the problems. And I'm afraid with this recent spate of, of people like Bill Gates releasing his climate book and all these very wealthy white um, industrial aligned like capitalists um, who have benefited off, you know, workers and the destruction of the environment for decades. Um, of course, they are going to align themselves with these insane technocratic solutions that utterly violate um, well, everything, <laughs> moral law, living law, the, the law of, of, it's just, I find it so reprehensible. And, and I, before I read this book, I just thought like, well, any serious environmental thinker would just like not even put this on the table because this is just so clearly wrong. Um, and so I, I clearly am still freaked out by it um, because I, I believe as, as Craig and Mona Lisa do that, you know, it's the will of the people um, and it is the lives of the people, not of this, you know, sort of technocratic elite that need to provide the solutions 
for our own needs and for our, the ongoingness of our own lives and for the bioregions that we all live in, which have, as Mona Lisa so beautifully describes, very individual needs. Um, not only those of us who live in them can speak to because with any intimacy or expertise. Um, I say this having moved a million times all across the United States. So I am no expert on where I'm living now, but I know enough to know that I'm not. So um, I don't know. I really believe in the politics that that Craig and, and Mona Lisa, I share that. And I have seen that in the various communities where I live, the anti-pipeline work that's going on here, um, indigenous water justice that's also going on here, um, anti-refinery uh, activism in South Philly where I used to live. Like I've seen all of, I've seen the community being the only ones who will address their own needs that the, and hold power accountable to those needs, to answering to those needs. And so I worry a lot about, the, about this kind of power imbalance between the greater kind of like white capitalist technocratic elite. And um, that just really doesn't know what life on the ground, life on our individual grounds, which are all very different, um, what we need. Um, so I worry a lot <laughs> and I don't, and I also worry about offering a solution that isn't for my community or for, for um, so again, to me, it comes back to, and I know I'm kind of going on and I'll stop. It just goes back to like, how do we balance the individual um, bioregional community level needs with, the, with what we all know is a biospheric crisis? And those are answers I just find that really hard to think through. Um, and I'm not, I know the sort of individual consumerist things I can do to like mitigate what I add to the larger things, but I, the more meaningful change I feel like actually happens on the community level. Um, but I don't know what other people would say. Thank you, Brian. I just, I want to thank you and Craig. Uh, you've been brilliant, really. And thank you for your thoughtful responses and really just heartfelt. And I agree with you, Brian. It's, and thank you for that, amen, because sometimes we're on the ground. We, we just don't have a sense, but I can see it. The fact that instead of four feet of water, there are trees drinking it up and so there's less flooding and, but convincing other neighbors to have trees is, you would not believe how big a challenge that is. It's uh... In South Philadelphia, people, which is deep, Philly has some of the worst air in the country. So one would need trees. My South Philadelphia neighbors actually said, trees, trees are fucking filthy. <laughs> And I was like, wait, what? And they were like, they drop leaves everywhere and birds sit in them and shit in your car. And then they're like, what, acorns and stuff? And you have to clean it up. It's just, they're fucking filthy. And I was like, okay. I had not ever considered this angle on the tree before. I really, but I was like both horrified and also sort of like, I, I mean, I see your point. Like technically they do create a lot of debris. I do understand that. So I would not be surprised, Mona Lisa. I think I have seen the resistance. I just wanted to add uh, briefly as another solution, uh, thinking about, about care and caregiving, Mona Lisa mentioned. Uh, caregiving earlier so it's stuck in my mind and uh, just hearing that story about trees also makes me think about you know an important thing we need to do is is increase our caring capacity we need to care more uh, about other people that are different from us other nations uh, you know more than human species we need to care about uh, refugees and we need to care about landscapes and you know and trees and and the water 
And so, uh, you know, of course, poetry is a powerful way in which we can cultivate that care and, you know, develop uh, uh, ethics of, of care and caregiving, which we're seeing is, is even more important now during the pandemic as well. Anyway, so just wanted to, to throw that in since it, Mona Lisa sparked that word earlier. Thanks for that, um, for all of that. And I appreciate that, um, well, so much of what everybody said, but um, that last note too of, of bringing that idea of caregiving and, and care into the conversation. And if anyone has any anything to add there, um, but also, um, also inviting anyone um, who might have questions to, to put into the chat. Um, but yeah, I invite you all to sort of, can, oh, oh, here's one from Woodland Pattern, but not me Woodland Pattern, somebody else Woodland Pattern, um, Jenny and Laura, thank you. So um, what are you hopeful about these days? I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm hopeful about this new generation. I am so stoked that, because to me there was a big disconnect. We, we spent so much effort and lives and work to become beautifully black. And then women became women and people of, people who were questioning who they were, whether it was her or what, how they wanted to partner became themselves and are becoming more accepted. It's, it's almost like humanity's peeling off the blinders and trying to let, some people are letting people live. I'm hopeful about that. I'm hopeful that all the increments are, I see change. I see the change. And the generation that I'm teaching care. They care. And that is so humbling to me. They don't know, they're, they're, they're so exposed to information. They don't always know how to process it and they don't have the depth, but that's what we're for, <laughs> hopefully. And, but I am very hopeful about this generation that they are kinder and gentler, even though some of them have a stuff in their heads that's coming from another generation that's just confusing them. And they, it's not everybody, but I am hopeful about this generation that they wanna be more fair to people. They want people to live a good life. They, and they wanna to try to, and, and I love that as, as hard as it's been to see somebody black get killed so often in front of my face. When I was a child, I was always undercover. It was somebody being lynched or somebody disappeared. And to see the Black Lives Matter protesters so many whites, so many blacks, so many Latins, even Asians, everybody together, indigenous people together and people stepping up for immigrants. It's just, I'm hopeful that some of us are waking up. Uh, for me, definitely uh, Mona Lisa and Brian are, are giving me hope over this, this past hour, um, Woodland, Woodland Pattern, you folks give me hope every time I see the wonderful programming you're doing and uh, the great time I had when I could be there in person. Uh, shout out to Brenda, who, who I see is in the room. Um, you know, the, the youth climate movement, the Sunrise Movement has given me a lot of hope as well uh, to see how mobilized and, and educated and passionate the young people are about the environment. Um, here in Hawaii is very, a vibrant uh, environmental movement as well, led by uh, Native Hawaiian peoples, but also many allies. And, uh, you know, even though this year has been difficult, spending more time with my kids and my wife because we're all stuck at home uh, has given me, given me hope as well and, and lots of joy. Um, and, you know, just Seeing, you know, the folks with Black Lives Matter uh, gave me a lot of hope. The movement for to stop Asian hate happening as we speak is, is giving me hope as well. And, you know, hope to me is is, is a verb and it's a muscle and, and something that 
we again need to cultivate and, and keep keep strong and active and resilient. And so I'm really grateful uh, for this conversation today, which has contributed to that. I share Craig's gratitude for Woodland Pattern um, and also Craig's sorrow that we're not there in person. Um, it's always been special um, to visit and to be near Niedeker's home, homeland as well. Um, I, you know, I um, will be honest and say I'm temperamentally not a particularly hopeful person. Um, in part because I grew up in a very difficult um, household um, in the South, uh, really religious, and saw how violent and cruel um, ideology could be um, from a very young age. And so I, it takes me a lot to trust the world and to trust other people, actually. So. Um, a, I'm moved by moments like this where we are trusting and being in community together. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity. And I will say that the thing that um, I never thought I would live in the South again, I, I um, was very surprised to find myself coming back here. Um, and I have never been so moved as seeing statues on Monument Avenue and the former capital of the Confederacy come down. Um, the statue of Jefferson Davis. I just literally never thought I would ever live to see a gesture like that in, in the South and particularly in the capital of the former capital of the Confederacy. I was shocked. Um, and it, and to watch um, the the black and brown communities decide what to do on their own with those atrocities. Um, I also found really moving that they were repurposed as community spaces, as gathering points, um, and then painted and commented upon and annotated and tagged and, and projected upon. I just could not I have not ever been so hopeful as seeing that happen. Um, and I remain, uh, I remain moved by those empty pedestals with nothing on them. Um, and, and, um, and with the remaining language um, that the community has decided to put there. I just, I find all of that so beautiful um, and so imp because it is so improbable, given the ideology of the South and the history of the South and, and, a, and a place like Virginia, which really innovated um, in racist law. Um, I, yeah, so that has given me some hope, I will say, um, and, and shifted things for me in a way that I, I uh, honestly had never thought possible. Thank you all so much. Um, I think hope, that's a good note to end on. Right? Um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate um, all of you. You're just incredibly thoughtful, personal, just wonderful answers, um, just, yeah. This has been a wonderful conversation to, to listen to, and I appreciate you all. And I'm so excited for the reading, um, which also, you know, of course, I wish that it could be at Woodland Pattern, but this is still nice. And it's great to see you all, and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow night. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Thank you for a great conversation. You guys are brilliant. I love you and appreciate you so much it's inspiring and I'm, I'm, I'm taking that with me Brian hope is a muscle baby <laughs> I love it I love it a verb that is a muscle that's brilliant both of you are brilliant thank you and thank you Michael for this thank you, and thank you Woodland Pattern thank you so much thank you all
and to our interpreters. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Please, everyone, have a have a good local beer uh, on my behalf tonight. I miss that too. That too gives me hope. <laughs> All right. And, see and you so tomorrow. Mass like it's Mardi Gras. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night.